Pokemon Clover is a fire red ROM hack that features 380 fan made Pokemon, two regions, a plethora of edgy internet humor, and soul. I'll tell you right now, it's best to experience this game blind, if only for the joy in slowly discovering all the Pokemon by yourself. Let me tell you, this game can legitimately compete with the mainline Pokemon games in terms of scope, quality, structure, and presentation. And in many ways, I'd even say it surpasses them. Without going into detail, the pros are solid sprite work, comfy Pokemon feels, good old 4chan brand humor, and a surprising amount of polish. It's completely free to play and I had no problems running it on my shitty laptop. Just be warned, if you don't like 4chan's brand of humor, you might find the experience obnoxious or offensive at times. But if you like anime, you'll love this game. I can guarantee it because this is the bike theme. Totally worth entering that pissing contest for. If you're interested, links to the game and a matching GBA emulator in the description. The monsters are really the foundation for any traditional Pokemon game, so let's start with them. The sprite work for this game is pretty great. After combing through the Pokedex, I failed to find a single Pokemon with an amount of polish anything less than professional. Or at least, something that can be mistaken for professional. They range from cool, to haunting, to adorable, to shitty meme humor brought to life in an unexpected way. If you're having concerns about that third group, here are the three starter Pokemon. Let that color your expectations going forward. Many of the Pokemon in the Fortran region, yes that's the name, are made with the intention of carrying the game's humor. Some based off memes, video games, anime, or otherwise famous internet imagery. Made with the intent to parody the culture of 4chan's various image boards. Many had me chuckling out loud upon seeing them. I find it adds a lot of charm to the game, especially coupled with the comfy Pokemon atmosphere and the cheeky dialogue. However, I can understand if the abundance of joke Pokemon ends up taking some players out of the experience and undercutting their adventure and immersion. There are plenty of Pokemon that aren't jokes to balance this out, and a Pokemon like Scrap might hit a comfortable balance between a joke and a neat Pokemon concept. But it's hard to deny Pokemon like Anonymous, Fishinism, Bandash, Fernazi, Gay, and Jerstito are exactly the type of Pokemon to destroy your suspension of disbelief. In spite of that possibility, I find even the joke Pokemon to be worth using and training. They're still fully fleshed out and worth considering for your team. Some even have signature moves, and as we discover later, some have interesting lore behind them. Turns out Picotten and Motherfuck were the result of Pokemon fusion experiments. But if you still hate them, understand, they're definitely not the majority. So if you need to ignore them, it's not impossible. The fairy types in particular are something I'd want the official games to take inspiration from. They're not all pink, round, girly fairies. Now I like me some pink, round, girly fairies. But the oversaturation of them really does make the type feel homogenous. Pokemon like Baitmaster and Honraid are recognizable as fairies. One is a colorful trickster and the other is a brave little warrior right out of a fairy tale. They expand the idea of what a fairy type can be without stretching the concept thin. The Pokemon may be the backbone of the game, but we can't forget the structure around them. This is where Clover really shines. I believe it surpasses the official games in how it structures the Pokemon adventure. There are more than a few surprises if you go in blind. Not just in making unique areas that never appeared in normal Pokemon games, but also in how it improves some ideas from those games. Dodging the eyes of trainers is a skill most Pokemon fans use when replaying games, so it's only natural to have a whole area where the goal is to avoid being seen. It's fun, it adds variety, it's funny in context, and just when you think you haven't figured out it throws a curveball to make it more exciting. It expands one of the base mechanics of Pokemon in a fun, cool way. The story is also full of neat surprises. Despite being transparently based on the usual formula, you're still collecting badges and fighting an evil team, some story beats are even ripped straight from Fire Red, but the game finds fun ways to spin most of them, and sometimes you just get hit with something completely unexpected and out of left field. The major characters aren't amazing, typically they're given a single role and a couple personality traits. Some get a small character arc and some even have some neat connections as we see later, but it's not really the focus. They are charming for what they are, and naturally they also feed into the humor. 
that's about as much as you can expect from a laid back Pokemon game. The volume of content Clover offers rivals that of Gold and Silver, with a post game region and gyms with all new Pokemon to discover, a new evil team plot, and just when you think it's over the game reveals that there is still more going on. I have not even completed the game, I had just reached the final battle with the box art legendary. Post game areas themselves have some of the most memorable scenarios and challenges. It was easily the best part of the game. Here are some major spoilers regarding the post game legendaries. 3, 2, 1. You find a legendary in the basement of your house and it's not only painfully funny, but pretty darn cool in context. The side adventures for the legendaries was actually a highlight. I dare say, they had more thought put into them than most official Pokemon games bother doing. Most of them simply involve going to a special location and finding a legendary, just waiting there. Clover isn't dissimilar, but there's much more razzle dazzle. For example, Sasquatch will constantly stalk you throughout his woods, building anticipation towards his encounter. You even meet a crazy old man who will tell you ghost stories about Sasquatch. You initially can't get into the cave for this abomination of a legendary because a horde of weebs are clustered around the entrance looking for their waifu. It's nice foreshadowing, and it even ends up in a proper boss battle before you fight the legendary herself. And here's some major spoilers about the climax. The leader of Team Karma fights you in a giant mech and it's so cool, oh my god, I love it. It's like I'm, it's like I'm in the Pokemon anime, I'm in the Pokemon anime, and I'm fighting the evil team and their big evil robot, it's so cool, it's great, oh my god. And right after you defeat him, he catches the box art legendary in a master ball, then fights you with it, along with his full team. That's so badass. Although one thing I have to say isn't engaging about Pokemon games, including Clover, is saves coming to catch a particular legendary Pokemon. It's not fun when you reset the game for the 8th time just to mash A until you get lucky. The system works well enough for natural and early encounters, but in the late game it doesn't respect the player's time. But having these more elaborate narratives makes the side quests and catching the legendary Pokemon worth it. Along the journey there are various NPCs in the game that can actually offer a good bit of convenience relative to their location. The first gym leader Brock, and he's the only gym leader who's not a new character, has a very strong ace in Chompest, a dark rock type. But there's also an NPC willing to trade you a fighting water type in exchange for a gutsy fly. This game's equivalent of a Butterfree. In a late game area that is maze-like with plenty of wild Pokemon, there's an NPC that will sell you illegal repels. More dangerous than normal repels. These inclusions make the journey go smoother and shows a consideration towards the player and how they might feel in some scenarios. This also includes improving HM moves. You don't need a tutor for your Pokemon to unlearn them, and they have been made stronger through changing types or even adding new utilities. Many players dread obtaining HM moves, because they don't want any members of their team to get stuck with a weak move for a long period of time. The official Pokemon games tried to rectify this in different ways, but the solution is actually really simple, at least for the earlier Pokemon games. However, just because there's a bit more quality of life doesn't mean this game holds your hand. Pokemon Clover is considerably more difficult than any of the mainline Pokemon games. I have no doubt this is because the hardcore fans behind the development of Clover craved a challenge that the mainline games did not offer coupled with the fact that this game has so much content to squeeze in. Before I mention that the first gym leader Brock has a strong Pokemon named Chompest. Its ability is Intimidate, which if you don't know is rather strong, and it knows Crunch, which is a move far stronger than any level 15 Pokemon could possibly have in an official game. I needed a full team of 6 and 3 tries to defeat that thing. And my brother who played alongside me struggled even more. He had to evolve his starter and still failed several times before finally defeating Brock but he sucks at every video game, so you'll probably do better than him. The leader right after, Tumblrita, has four Pokemon, all of whom know Ice Beam, another move far stronger than what the levels should suggest. By the time you make it to the third gym, the gym leaders will start having items used in competitive play like eject buns, leftovers, and white herbs. This Marlizard in particular was a nightmare because of its white herb, toke smoke combo. Yeah. By the sixth gym, the leaders along with the strongest of root trainers will have a full team of 6. 
This is one detail I really like because it means all the trainers in Victory Road have a full team of 6, giving the illusion that they might actually have a fighting chance against the Elite Four. It also sells just how powerful the Elite Four must be. They aren't the hardest challenge because they use more Pokemon than everyone else. It's because each of their Pokemon is that much more of a threat. The Elite Four will have Pokemon whose levels even climb into the 70s, and whose movesets are tightly tuned. If it weren't for the fact that they largely consisted of one type, you could mistake them for teams ready for competitive play. Fighting them was a real highlight and the twist with the Master is pretty funny. Your mom has a balanced team with a legendary and even a level 100. It's not a terribly strong Pokemon but it did offer its own unique challenge. <coughs> in the post game, the trainer fights leading up to the final battle will have a full team of 6 with Pokemon in the upper 90s and even some level 100s. On top of everything, healing items are banned in most important trainer battles, meaning you won't be able to revive spam your way to victory every time. I appreciate this difficulty because having to think about my approach in battles brings me that much closer into the game. It's a taste that I can't get from the official games without a self-imposed challenge. The EXP share is given to you almost immediately at the beginning of the game, incentivizing a team of 6 from the beginning and making it easier to train your Pokemon. This balances out the difficulty somewhat, or more accurately, it shaves down on the time you would spend grinding. The EXP share actually sparks something of a debate in the Pokemon community. Does it make the game too easy? Personally, I don't think so. All it does is save time. Let's be honest, RPG level grinding is not a very engaging mechanic. It can be used to give the player a sense of progression, and it works especially well for Pokemon because it's about slowly training these cute little monsters into formidable warriors, but grinding for levels in a turn-based game is not very engaging. In fact, it's the most brain dead any video game has ever been. If you truly care about difficulty in a Pokemon game, then the only way to really get it is in self-imposed challenges. Nuzlocke's an evolved level capping one Pokemon only, restricting the type of Pokemon you can use. Pokemon fans have found countless ways to make these games more difficult. Having difficulty in go grind for another 20 minutes is the most boring way to go and it doesn't respect the player's time. Also the final challenge of the game is fighting the Elite Four again and this time all of their levels are 100. The EXP share can't give you an advantage here. Before I finish off, I'd be remiss not to talk about the change from sprite work to 3D models in the main series and how that has affected the culture of the Pokemon fanbase. I, like many others, preferred the 2D sprites to the 3D models. The sprites look like artwork of the Pokemon, with striking poses and expressions, while the models tend to be made like literal translations of what the Pokemon would actually look like. It's like comparing an expressive drawing of an animal to an anatomically accurate drawing in a textbook. But there are advantages to using 3D models. Sword and Shield's wild area was exactly the type of thing I want to see from Pokemon. Something ambitious and different. Something that a fan game like Clover couldn't replicate with sprite work. Having the code for the older Pokemon games like Fire Red open to the public lets fans pick up the ball the original developers threw two decades ago and continue running with it. We the people can iterate and mix the old style, while big companies can do what only they can do and innovate with new ideas. An open world of Pokemon habitats is something that a 2D sprite game couldn't be able to capture as well as 3D models. If Pokemon doesn't make changes and innovate, I have less reasons not to stick with free fan games like Clover. Be aware, Clover isn't one of a kind. There are hundreds of Pokemon fan games both in development as I speak and completed. We're in an age where game development is widely accessible, and that's just really cool. Pokemon Clover's greatest strengths could only exist in a fan game. No official Pokemon game would ever feed into the fan culture with such conviction. They'd be too busy making it squeaky clean for commercial success, or tuning the difficulty so even young kids can play and make it to the end. That's by no means a bad thing, mind you. Dumb Gen Xers deserve to enjoy Pokemon as much as we did, but Pokemon tends to neglect the concerns of the more hardcore fans. Clover is made by longtime Pokemon fans for longtime Pokemon fans. It picks up concepts and mechanics that the official games dropped while filling holes that hardcore players care about, all while doing its own thing and wearing its intentions on its sleeve. Pokemon Clover is a good game. If you're not sold on it yet, then I'll remind you. It's free, easy to install, packed with quality content, fun Pokemon, cheeky humor, comfy music, an insane amount of polish, an engaging enough narrative, 
Like really, what more could you possibly ask from a Pokemon game? If you're a Pokemon fan, then the only thing that should stop you is if you don't like the humor and would rather play another ROM hack. I understand if you don't want to battle your mom and her shiny box of dragon dildos. Hey Pokemon, gotta catch em. it's you and 